Welcome everybody. Come on in and take your seats. We're about to get started. Excellent. So welcome to Sector's Capital Market Day. We have an exciting day ahead of us. Uh, my name is Lisa Everhill. I work with people, culture, and branding related questions at Sector. I've been here for some 16 years now. We have some even more exciting people coming along though after myself. Before lunch, we will talk about our overall strategies. We'll talk about sector communications and our business innovation initiatives. We'll go into lunch. You'll have an opportunity to actually see some of our solutions up in the demo stations on the two different floors. And after lunch, we'll head into imaging IT. So before lunch, it's our CEO, Torbjörn Kronander. You have the sector crew up here if you want to see them live. We have Magnus School, very present on sector communications. And we have Johan Karl Legrim right there, and Gustav Schwang. And then Torbjörn will represent one of our business innovation initiatives. So throughout the agenda, some uh, playground rules. Um, we'll save questions till after the presentation. So after all the different, each business unit, we'll do a little gathering and Q&A. So uh, note your questions. There are microphones between each uh, two chairs. So uh, when given the word, you can just use the microphone uh, and ask your questions. But I'll remind you again when we get to that stage. Uh, with that being said, uh, I will, Oh, so, sorry. So after lunch, we'll talk about imaging IT, and we'll have uh, Marie ekström Tragord heading the business air unit. We have Fredrik Gustafsson, our CTO, and we have Isaac Zawarski, flown in from the US, president of our North American US organization. So with that said, Torbjörn, let's get started with our overall strategies. So hello. Um, it's nice to see you all here. Uh, not so much strategies, I will just do a little intro. For some of you, you have seen this several times before. It will be kind of boring. Please do not snore aloud. Uh, otherwise, as some of you are new, we decided to take it from the grounds up, how we think and how we organize and how we plan what we're doing. Uh, and I will start with the curve. Uh, this is a revenue trend from 1978 when Sector was founded. Uh, I was not around, well, I was around, but I was a new student at the university by then. Uh, Sector was founded by a professor and three of his doctoral students to create the encryption systems of the ATMs of Sweden. Sweden, as being a country far up north, and is pretty trigger happy for new technologies. A lot of new technologies has started here. Uh, mobile phones, not the least, but we also see it in digital pathology that will become back to later. This is the curve of the revenue. Uh, and you see, we started with the medical around 1991. And then there's three dips on that curve. First one was, was uh, when we lost a big channel, uh, Philips Solar Packs Worldwide. Um, that was tough. We managed, and, and it was a special feeling. We were sold into Eindhoven in Holland, finally. Uh, and then uh, we had another, uh, another dip when we sold off our mammography division. We are a software company, we're not a hardware company. And it seems extremely difficult to do both in one company. We see that when the large modality companies, our comparison packs, tried to do IT. It has not been a raving success, to say the least. Uh, but you also saw it when we tried to do hardware. It didn't go very well. We sold it to Philips. Uh, but we lost revenues, but profits went up. And then the third dip is COVID up there. <coughs> OK, a little about who we are and how we think. So who am I? Uh, I'm the founder of the medical side of Sacra. Uh, I'm the son of a radiologist once. Uh, she became a gynecologist later. And when she was alone with two kids, so I more or less grew up in a radiology department. That's where we went up to after school, because she was coming home at 8 o'clock at night or something like that. Um, I'm the largest owner today uh, by, by votes, but John Ola Bria, my predecessor, is about the same. I have a few, few more than him. Uh, I have been the CEO and president of all the sector. I started the medical. I, I was managing medical until 2012. And when I took over as CEO, John Olof, I had other plans. And, and after, I think, 27 years as president, he wanted to do something else. And I took over that. Um, 
it was not actually my plan to take over this, um, but I didn't want to have another manager above me, except for Jan Olof, so that's what ended up. Uh, I was uh, a naval officer in the reservist in the Swedish Navy. I grew up in Gotland. Uh, I'm a master of science in electrical engineering or medical uh, technology and PhD in information theory, which is signal processing. MBA from Hanesök Skolan and also uh, honorary doctor of medicine. Sailor, most things that float, pilot of most things that fly. Uh, and I have eight kids, of which six of my own. So this is my background. So, uh, contents of this presentation, we will have an overview, a little about the overall goals, how we think. <coughs> Current market position, sorry about that. See if I can go back there. Uh, a little about future opportunities and then question, but the questions will come after the next speaker. So don't ask me questions, please, but not now, do it later. Otherwise we'll break the, the plan for this. So the main business lines of sector is IT security still. That's where we started. And uh, that's where we came from, sector stand for secure transmission. We still do extremely advanced uh, encryption systems. And Magnus Skogbank will talk about a little later in more detail about that area. It's about 10% of sector today, but an important 10%. Uh, we have imaging IT, which is Maria's setting, which is the, kind of the area that I started up, handling, mainly handling images in hospitals. All images today, radiology only from the beginning. And then we have our little greenhouse, where we have products that will something will happen with one day. They, they can become a complete business line themselves, or they can be incorporated into another area, or they can be spun off, or they can be shut down. And we have examples of all. Uh, Mammograph we, we spun off or sold. Uh, and uh, digital pathology came from research uh, and is now part of imaging IT. Uh, orthopedic special customers growing. We made a corporation or a company out of it last year. Uh, medical education which also came out of research from the beginning, but is now growing rapidly around the world. And a new one that many of you haven't seen. We started Genomics IT this year, uh, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Uh, Frederick Lysholm, who runs that, he is a home working and doing um, programming himself, so I'm, I will present his part uh, later on. Our philosophy of shareholders is quite simple. Um, if you have a rational strategy in a growing market, and we like growing markets, it's tough to be in a st stagnant or stable market. It's difficult to grow, and you more or less have to fight with prices to grow. But we try to be in growing markets. Then, if you have happy customers, and in order to have happy customers, you must have happy employees. It's literally impossible to create happy customers with unhappy employees. That will kind of you spread that culture out to the customers. Uh, they're to be a little expensive at times, because if you have good quality, you have to be you know, willing to be expensive, otherwise it doesn't match up. Uh, have reasonable cost control and some stubbornness, then shareholders will be happy. But it comes in that order, and we've been very specific about that. Some people said shareholders first, and that is not the good way. This is a better way. Uh, so let's start with a rational strategy in a grown market. So we work in the markets of in medicine, and I will start. I normally start with this. This is a population pyramid, Sweden. We have too few people down here in order to serve these old farts like me when we get old. The population pyramid should have been a little triangle, uh, but it's not. Now I've done my share. I've got six, but not everyone has, uh, and this is a problem. It would be very, very difficult to keep healthcare on a standard we had when a lot of people get old and there's just few people behind it. And Sweden is quite good, actually. This is Italy. Now, you want to produce wine and fiats and a lot of other things as well in Italy. How on earth should you be taking care of all these people? They're still productive. It hasn't really hit the fan yet, but it will. When these people average are 70, 80, there will be very few people to take care of them if they're going to do anything else in Italy but taking care of old people. Now, people say Italy, well, that's you know, not the biggest economy in Europe, but look at the locomotive, the engine of all economy in Europe. 
The national economists say if you have a lot of people in productive age between 25 and 60 something, uh, let's take 65, as I am 65, so up to 65 when you do some good for society, that's productive people. If you have a lot of people in that age rate span and few dependents, few old and few young, then the, your economy grows like crazy because you use everything used for production. You don't have a dependence to take care of. The problem with that is that time goes, a uh, lot of people will become dependents and there will be fewer that take care of them. This is a real problem for Europe. US is a little better, but there's a huge ethnicity shift in, in, in the US. So the people who make the most money, who stands for a lot, large portion of the economy, they have fewer kids, and people who are uh, migrants uh, a lot have more kids. Uh, and uh, so it looks in US as it's such a colossal mix of people. And they are better off, actually, a little better off. Still a problem, but more like Sweden. So what does it lead to? Well, this leads to that we also get older, we live longer, which will lead to that the cost for healthcare will explode. And we in Europe say, we look at the upper curve here and we say, that's the US, oh, and they kind of make fun of them and because they're not really, they're not really taking care of this, they have very expensive healthcare. But it's not a difference, they're just ahead of us. Look at the derivative of these curves. All of them are pointing upwards. US is today, I think, at 20% of GDP for healthcare. That won't work. You need to do something else. You cannot, like, approach 100% of GDP for healthcare. It won't work. This will not work. Now, most, most people have seen this. The, if you break this down on age bracket instead, so you look at the cost per capita for 10 euros, 20 euros, 30 euros. It's not such a big difference. US is still a little more expensive, except for 50-year-olds, where most Germans are right now, where Germany is most expensive. And then, but look what happens after 60. Boom, all countries. Except one very weird country here, where it doesn't grow linearly with increasing age, and that's Sweden. Above 80 in Sweden, we seem to have a little problem, uh, because we don't, we don't increase it in Sweden. But in the general thing, the cost goes up with age. So if you're going to handle this situation, you have to look at the, the, the diseases of the aging person. That's where you have, if you're going to treat those curves, that's where you need to go. And those diseases of the elderly is neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer, MS, Parkinson, very, very, very expensive. We need to cope with it somehow. We have cardiovascular disease, not heart infarctions, they're quite cheap, you get well or you die. But chronic heart failure, super expensive. Cancer disease, if we live not long enough, we get cancer. Musculoskeletal disease, grossly underestimated. We don't know why, because it's the most expensive area. Um, but it might be connected to its mainly women disease. Uh, and it, it's undertreated and underrepresented, it's super expensive. And vision, we've added vision. Last time we spoke of this, we didn't have vision here. But we actually got a request from Kaiser Permanente in the US to create an ophthalmology system for them. And, and that is not now rolled out all over Kaiser, um, which is like a country in Europe. Um, but we also discovered that vision, if you can't see, you're very expensive. So that needs to be handled as well. And these. If we're going to attack the growing cost of society, we have to attack these five. And that's where we should be. We are do medical imaging as a base, and we're, of course, we need to treat pediatrics and children and stuff as well, but we should be very good in, in diagnosis in these areas. And that's where we go with all the medical side of sector. And vision and hearing is new. So the, business, the mission statement in the medical, to increase effectiveness, because that's where the money will be, of healthcare while maintaining or increasing quality in patient care. We do not have as a goal to increase the quality, but that's very often what happens when we do things. But the main thing is to increase effectiveness. A few, ten, five to 10 years ago, you didn't hear the argument of cost in the US, for instance. We heard it here, but not in the US. Today, every customer we speak to in the US, even the most wealthy and the richest of the hospital providers, healthcare providers, Everyone talks about cost. It's a massive change after COVID. 
In cybersecurity, so this drives the market in medicine. It's a market that has to grow. So in cybersecurity, of course, we have the general situation in Europe. We have Ukraine. Everyone all of a sudden is much more aware of that. You know, we thought there would be no more wars in Europe ever. That was naive, unfortunately. Uh, politicians tend to be naive sometimes. Um, but most of us didn't think this would happen. But now we're there. We have a war very sh short distance from here. And of course, everyone's more scared. This drives the market. Uh, add to this, in general society, we have an increasing dependence on IT. Everything is depending on IT. So, and, and ransomware is attacking. Most people are aware of phishing today. And there is enormous cost in, in, in IT for cybersecurity. And we have entire country. North Korea have thousands of very smart people making money for North Korea. My ransomware, we know it, but it's very difficult to prove it. And North Korea doesn't care, they need money. So they use, and that's, you know, the national scale of attacking civil, uh, civil companies in, in, in the Western world. Attackers are getting smarter and smarter and more. This is not anymore three guys in a garage, you know, leaving X-ray was here on, on some web page somewhere. This is organized cyber crimes, is mafia or even countries such as that who actually attack to get money. There's even a help desk. Some of these ransomware companies, they're on the dark net. If you, if you get the, you pay, you get the key back, you don't, are not able to restore your systems with a key, there's a help desk. You can call a help desk. They will help you because you paid. This is not three guys in a garage anymore. Secure communications and infra critical infrastructure are a core of this situation. We need to have encryption for communications. We need to protect the most critical functions of society. We see what the Russians do in Ukraine now. Now they're bombing it. Um, but if you can destroy that with over IT, of course, it's very efficient. No, no one can even prove what you do. And it's a little too scary uh, what we built in society today. We also see synergies between uh, these two. Uh, in, in normal, if, you, if a company gets a ransomware attack, you know, it's, it's a long way before you pay. Because normally you say, we will not pay. We will not teach people that you can make money by ransomware attacks. You take double the cost, but you will not pay the crooks. That's money only. The problem is when a hospital gets attacked, pay, people die. People die, patients die. So, and then you can reason in that way. And that, of course, leads to that a lot of, especially US customers, US hostels today have ready-made Bitcoin accounts. They pay out immediately when they have an attack. And guess who knows that? The cyber crooks, of course. The mafia knows that hostels pay. My healthcare today is by far the most attacked industry, industry or area in society for uh, cyber attacks. And there we have synergies. We were awarded at the RSNA, which is a lot of radical show last year, to be the most cyber secure company of uh, all our competitors. And before, 10 years ago, people, our customers in for here or in the US, they said, ah, that's not important for us. You guys say, why do you do this in the same company? Uh, you know, cyber security and healthcare. Now we have synergies. And they are growing. And there is like 200 questions in RFP today about cybersecurity questions to us when we sell medicine. So there are synergies now and benefits. It's more of a reputational and knowledge-based synergies. The products we sell in communications are not used in hospitals. But we have a lot of benefits because we know how to build secure systems. Nothing is 100% secure, though. But we are secure than most. So, Leading the purpose of sector communications, protect our society from cybercrime, from individuals, but also from nations, because that's a span we see today. The interesting thing with both of these, as I said from the beginning, profitable growth is easy in a growing market. And especially good if it's a market that has to grow, if it's a recession or high tides or whatever, they have to grow anyways. And both our main markets are markets like that. Healthcare has to grow because that population pyramid will not change if we have a low tide in the economy. 
And cybersecurity is growing all the time because we're becoming more and more industrial or digitized in society. That's the background. Uh, and then we now added genomics IT, which we have no have products, we have no demos yet, but that's also a heavily growth market because it's so important in, in oncology and cancer care. For diagnostics and cancer care, it's super important. So this is kind of the background how we think about things. Um, and again, if you have a rational strategy in a growing market, you are well, you have a good foundation for your company building for growth in the future. That's why we have these markets. Now you need happy customers. And we have been awarded uh, the most happy customers in the entire United States, large hospitals, for nine years in a row. The jury's out if it's going to be a tenth. We don't know that yet. Um, but that that's kind of makes us a little proud, right? We're sitting in a little company in Sweden, Stockholm, Örebro, Linköping, and we are created the happiest customers in the entire US market in large hospitals, which is our main market, but also in small hospitals, which was not a main market from the beginning, but the culture of the companies, we take care of our customers. So we have the happiest customers in large companies, large hostels in the US for ninth year in a row. We have uh, small hostels for quite a few years. And we have the happiest customers in uh, Canada and with a huge margin, margin. And we have the happiest customers in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we are second in Europe. We need to fix that. Well, we're working on it. And, and we are second in pathology. And we have more customers in pathology than others, but we're very close. So we'll work on this as well. And these are the markets where we compete. So this shows we are succeeding. In, in, and Class is a company, independent company in the US, who actually sells reports. Before you buy large IT systems for healthcare, you want to know if they are OK. And Class spends all the time calling customers, say, what IT systems do you have? Are you happy with it? Very extensively. A lot of dimensions to that. There are our management. Do you see management? Do the company nickel and dime you? Uh, does the systems work as promoted? Is the service OK? All aspects. And then they rank all the vendors, and we're number one in these two. Um, in sector communication, there is no class. There is no um, independent company around us that can evaluate. So we do our own measurements. It's a little difficult in communications because we are not even allowed to know who's using our phones, for instance. Uh, we have no clue. Um, and we sell like thousands of these phones to EU. Where EU puts them, we cannot, we're not allowed to know. It's some of these guys are the people who had a telephone before, used it once and dropped it in the wastebasket. They have now our phones instead, so we don't know. But we have internal measurements as good as we can do it. And they indicate the same type in business innovation and in communications. We, are, we have the cultures all over the company, but we don't have external measurements for that. This makes our day. This is a, a comment uh, in class reports. You can also, they can also give comments about the vendors. And this is, look at this, CEO president of a large US hostel corporation. Sector has gone above and beyond, and I cannot say enough good things about them. Sector found out that they had made a mistake, which is OK. Everyone makes a mistake. But they worked hard to make it right. Uh, uh, I'll be a sector customer for life. And you see a lot of those in these reports. And that's what the, all the culture is about. We care about customers. We spend this one. We're quite greedy at sector. We, we don't want to spend money for unnecessary things. But in a customer in trouble, it's OK. You spend. You fix it. You just fix it. And that's how you create happy customers. For that, you need the happy employees. Uh, and without happy employees, you cannot create that customer situation. Because it's like having a broken car. You go to the garage to fix it, and there's an idiot behind the bar. You know, that's, you will not be happy even if they fix the car. But if that's a nice person, you feel like they, they, will, they really care about you getting your car fixed. The impression is like three times better. And in order to do that, you need to have happy employees. Debt to be expensive when you're worth it, and have reasonable cost control. We don't go business class over the Atlantic. 
Even I go uh, sit in the back seat unless I upgrade with miles or my own money. And that's kind of all over the company. We are careful with our money. We spend it for reasonable things. Um, but starting with happy employees, as I said, happy customers can only be achieved by happy employees. Uh, we are very careful about hiring. Uh, so I have the luxury of being probably one of very few people who work in a company with a thousand people where I selected everyone myself. If I don't like them, they don't get the job. Bad luck. So it's good. Uh, I have an extremely nice workplace because I like everyone we have. But we have five, four, three interviews with everyone. I see everyone still over Teams nowadays. But we, we hire people we like. Hopefully they will like each other. They don't, shouldn't be similar to us. We need a lot of diversity. But we want people that customers like and who can work as a team. We hire for attitude uh, and ability. They should be reasonably smart. And we train them for skill. And then continues with culture is structured for uh, strategy of breakfast. Some famous guru said that. Uh, Von Marie, who came up with that quote from the beginning. I never remember, remember who, but it's so true. You can try to regulate and have process for everything. It will not work unless you have the heart of the people. So we spend a lot on this. Um, and then, you know, with the major teaching we do, uh, it's a very one, a very old one. Uh, the only rule you find in all religions we ever found, just behave to others as you want them to behave to you. It's a little unusual having a, a president of an IT company preaching the oldest rule of all religions, but I'll tell you, that <laughs> takes you a long way. And that is what we try to get into the very heart of all employees. Because if we behave to others as we want them to behave to us, it will be fine. It's interesting. All religions we ever found have a version of this rule. And it has resulted that we were last year voted number four of the employees of Sweden of all employers as the best workplace. We were number one of all production companies. There were three consultants and companies ahead of us. And this is anonymous. You know, we have no control of it. And we're very happy about that. Uh, and this also is shows that we have people who like the workplace, and then they will behave good to customers. And the best possible cost control comes also from culture. You cannot have process for it. It doesn't work. A little about financials, finally, here. Um, we are transforming from a, uh, a license selling company to a recurring revenue company. That's a huge transformation. Most software companies are going through it or have gone through it, it results in delayed income and profits. And we will see that over the, already see it, uh, but we will see that. That short term, this will decrease our growth, it will decrease our profitability, but long term, it will be grossly benefits. It's very interesting. I pay as a person today to Microsoft. Before, I paid for a little box with licenses. Now I pay a subscription and I get upgrades automatically you know, every other week or so. I pay way more than I did before when I bought that box every three years, but I'm very happy with it. It's a very interesting effect. Both customers and vendors are benefiting from these solutions to compare to buying a license and then have only support. Usage of customers as well as not losing customers become crucially important in such an environment. They pay while they use it. They do not pay up front so much anymore. Uh, and we have very low churn. We'll come back to that. Uh, but usage becomes super important. And then we have new roles in all of sector of uh, customer success management. That's a parallel organization to sales. But they work mainly with going out to customers. If we see a decrease in usage, we go out there and find out why to get them to use the system, because that means they have a use of it, and they benefit from it, and we get more pay. So the customer success organization, will hear that for many presenters today, it's crucial in its new organization parallel to what we had before. Um, closely linked to sales, though, but not just people who sell. These are financial targets for the group uh, in order. Uh, a number one is stability of the company, so the assets to equity ratio, that should be above 30%. Our I was in Stanford, Stanford University Hostel in Palo Alto, where all the employees of Apple and Google and these places go if they get sick, right? And we have the facts. It's kind of 
nice feeling to have the packs in, in Stanford, made and delivered from Sweden. And I met the CIO, Michael Pfeiffer, uh, a very smart person, uh, both IT and medicine. Uh, and, and he said that the most critical system we have in this hospital is you. The medical record system, we can live without for a while if it doesn't work. But if the PAX goes down, the acute intake, the acute system, the emergency stops functioning, the entire hospitals come to a grinding halt. You cannot buy such a system from someone you don't trust. He was extremely clear about that you are the most important IT systems we have in the entire hospital. And then you need to be trustworthy. You cannot be sloppy about and apart that, they will not buy it from a company they think may, might go down the drain financially. So we need to have finance in order, stability. Then we have margin, second highest priority. But we, you know, we could take up our margin significantly if you wanted, but we want to grow. 15% is a good level if you want to have a sustained business and still spend money for growth. It's hygiene level. It's, this is not the target, it's a hygiene. If we reach 15%, we should all use all the money for growth. And our target for growth is growing um, profits per share. That means I wouldn't do it, I'm the largest shareholder. But my successor one day is a very common thing that you buy other companies for your own stock. Uh, it's more, actually it's more for the benefits and the ego of the management than for shareholders because you buy it too expensive. Now, if you have the man m measure in, in, in EBIT per share, you can't do that. You have to buy things that are better yourself if you're going to buy it with your own stock. That's why we have this rule. And the, rule, uh, uh, and the target there is to grow more than 50% over five years, and we are ways above that. We are currently at 84%. So, um, if you do all these things, shareholders will be happy. That's our, the uh, our theory, and we believe in it. All management sector are shareholders. And this has also shown in the share price development. Uh, I looked 10 years back, I found a figure of January 31st. Uh, we had a price of 750 per share. Uh, a few days ago, we had 163. That's about 21 times in 12 years. Uh, or a average growth of about 29% per year. So it seems that our strategy of thinking of having this order Growing markets, that has to grow, happy customers, happy employees. Cost control, it seems to work. So thank you very much, that was an introduction. I will now leave it over to Lisa again.